This is the podcast for AP Biology, Chapter 5, Part 1, which is on the biological membrane and passive transport. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is the cell membrane. There are six main components of the cell membrane. Number one is phospholipids. Number two, proteins. Number three, cholesterol. Four, carbohydrates. Five, glycoproteins. And six, glycolipids. So we're going to go through each one of those. Phospholipids, as a review, um, first of all, you should know that the membrane is a bilayer, which means it has two parts. One of the layers is polar heads. They are hydrophilic because they love water. One of the layers is nonpolar tails, and they are hydrophobic because they hate water. So your hydrophilic heads are here. Your hydrophobic tails are in the middle. Notice there are two tails per head, and that's how they are arranged in a cell membrane. Um, your hydrophilic head is where your choline group is, your phosphate group, and your glycerol, and then your fatty acids. One, remember, is saturated and one is unsaturated. That is your hydrophobic tails part. Um, second component are proteins. There are two main types of proteins that you can find in the cell membrane. Number one are integral proteins. These are proteins that are inserted into the membrane. They may be unilateral, which means they only go into the membrane part way, or they may be transmembrane, which means they completely go through the membrane. If you remove an integral protein, you will disrupt the cell membrane. The second type of protein that's found in the cell membrane are peripheral proteins, and these are not inside the membrane. They are attached on the surface. Um, they're attached to the integral proteins, or they might be attached to some type of filament from the cytoskeleton. If you remove a peripheral protein because it's not embedded, it will, its removal will have little effect on the membrane. So here's an example. Um, here is a peripheral membrane protein. Notice it is attached to the integral membrane proteins. This one is only going partway through, so that is unilateral. And the ones that are transmembrane go completely through your membrane, which is your polar heads and um, nonpolar tails, which is the phospholipid bilayer. So here's another peripheral membrane protein, and these are transmembrane proteins. They're both integral membrane, these two. There are seven functions of the membrane proteins. Number one, they anchor the cell. Two, passive transport, which we'll get into. Three, active transport, which is your next podcast. Four, they can be enzymes. Five, signaling into the cell. Cell recognition, recognizing foreign cells or foreign objects, um, and junction between cells, which means cells sticking together. Another component of the cell membrane is cholesterol. Cholesterol, remember, is a steroid, and so you can see the four rings here, and they are embedded within these fatty acid tails, and what that does is it controls the fluidity of the cell membrane. Um, the history of the cell membrane. There were two models. One was the sandwich model, and number two was the fluid mosaic model. That one is highlighted because that is the current model of the cell membrane. The sandwich model was developed by Davison and Danielli in 1935, and they perceived the plasma membrane as a sandwich, where the proteins were the bread and the phospholipid bilayer was the meat. The fluid mosaic model was done by Singer and Nicholson in 1972, and so if you look at the words, it, they said that the membrane was fluid, and it has to be fluid, and if it solidifies, the permeability will change and the enzymes will denature, um, and then it's also a mosaic, which means there are proteins embedded within it. So here's a picture of the davidson danielli sandwich model. Notice all the proteins are peripheral, and it's like the bread, and then this part was your meat, and then the fluid mosaic model, which is the current model, shows that the proteins are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer and that these molecules can move around a bit. Which model was correct? The fluid mosaic model. So here's another picture of the um, cell membrane. So you have your nonpolar tails, your polar heads, which makes up the phospholipid bilayer. Also, you have peripheral proteins, and then you have integral proteins. Attached to integral proteins, you might have some carbohydrates. This is the outside of the cell. Here are glycoproteins. Glyco means carbohydrate. Proteins means the protein. So these are carbohydrates attached to proteins, glycoproteins, or it could be a glycolipid. 
which would be some sort of a lipid structure um, and carbohydrate attached to the membrane. Um, from the fluid mosaic model, we said it was mosaic, which means it can move. And so these molecules can move over time. So if you see this green polar head, can move over and back, but they cannot cross and flip to the other side. They can only move laterally, so from one side around. They rarely flip across the lipid. Basic terms to understand, selectively permeable, prevents the passage of most materials through the membrane. You should know what a solute is, and that is what is dissolving, such as salt or sugar. You should know what a solvent is, and that's what it is dissolving in. In our case, it's most likely it's water. And then the solution is the mixture of the solvent and the solute. There are seven ways that substances can get into a cell. Number one, diffusion. Two, bulk flow. Three, osmosis. Four, facilitated diffusion. Five, active transport. Six, me vesicle-mediated transport. Seven, cell-to-cell -cell junction. So we're going to go through these, but not all of them today. We're going to stop at passive transport, which is one through four. Diffusion. Diffusion moves materials from a high concentration to a low concentration. Diffusion requires no ATP or energy. This is a type of passive transport. Um, easily things can pass through the membrane would be oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and very small polar molecules can get through. Slow passages means they can get through the membrane but at a slow rate would be larger polar molecules like glucose and any ions that have a charge obviously to them. Um, proteins will allow the movement of these polar and charged molecules. These particles will move until it is equal on both sides of the membrane. Um, bulk flow. Molecules will move all together at the same direction such as blood through a capillary due to hydrostatic pressure. This is defined as bulk flow. Osmosis. All things undergo diffusion. Water also diffuses, however, the water diffusion is not evident unless it's crossing a membrane. Osmosis is a diffusion of water across a membrane from a high concentration to a low concentration. No energy is required for osmosis, therefore it is a type of passive transport. Since cells have membranes, osmosis is very important to cells. So here is a picture of a tank that has a semi-permeable membrane, which is your red line right here. Okay, Water may pass through the membrane, but solute, which are these um, dots, cannot go through. So at first, the concentration of solute is very high on the left, as you can see. But over time, water will move across the semi-permeable membrane and will dilute the solute. Because there's more water over here than there is over here, water will move from the right to the left. That's why over time you see the water level has risen and that diluted the solute and some of the solute does dissolve. Water moves because it is polar. Um, because water is polar, it binds to the solute by hydrogen bonds. The concentration of water then is higher on the right. This is what I just explained. Water will then flow across the membrane down its concentration gradient to the left side of the tank. Um, next thing we want to talk about are osmotic environments. Hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. Isotonic is the easiest one. This is when you have the same solute concentration inside and outside the cell. So now we're talking about solute, what the concentration is of like the salt or the sugar on the inside and outside of the cell. Um, for isotonic, water will still flow in and out of the cell equally in both directions. Most cells in our body are isotonic. All right, first one we're going to do is hypertonic. Hypertonic is defined as having a high concentration of solute outside of the cell. So that means that is a cell that is in a lot of salt water or a very sugary substance. Therefore, because there's high concentration of solute outside the cell, there is more water as comparison inside the cell. So in a hypertonic environment, water will move out of the cell. If this process continues, the cell will collapse and die, and this is called plasmolysis. Lysis means break. Plasma is referring to the cell membrane. The opposite one is hypotonic. Hypotonic is low concentration of solute outside the cell. Therefore, there is more water outside the cell. This would be a cell like in distilled water where there's very little solute in there or zero solute. 
Um, water then will move inside the cell because there's more water out than in. This causes the cell to expand, causing trigger pressure in plant cells. In animal cells, they could possibly burst. They don't have that cell wall for protection. And if the cell wall bursts, that is called cytolysis, which is breaking of the cell. So here is a picture of red blood cells. Um, first one is isotonic. This is what a red blood cell would normally look like. And this is a picture of it under an electron microscope. Um, notice there is no net water movement. Water will still go from through um, the cell membrane inside the cell to outside the cell, but it will always be equal amounts at all times. Um, hypertonic environment, water will move inside, from inside the cell to outside the cell because there was more water inside than there was outside. This is like if there was a lot of salt in the speaker of water with that red blood cell. So if water is leaving the cell, the cells will get smaller and shrivel up as so. And that actually happens with these ones right here. Hypotonic is the opposite. There's more water outside the cell than inside the cell, so water will move in. If water is moving in, the vacuoles will get bigger, so the cell got expanded. Notice how much bigger this one is compared to this. It almost loses its biconcave shape, as you can see in the picture. Um, plant cells and osmotic pressure. In plants, hypotonic solutions produce osmotic pressure that produces turgor pressure, which means for hypotonic, the vacuole is going to get very large. That water is going to push up against the cell wall, and the plant will stay very tight and upright. In a hypertonic, the plant can get, get shriveled and start to um, lose its oomph and start to wilt, and so the vacuole is shrinking there. Um, turgor means tight or stiff owing to being very full. That's what turgor means. It keeps the plant upright. In hypertonic conditions, the plants will wilt. All right, another thing you can do with this is use dialysis. Dialysis is a diffusion of solutes when solutes move across the membrane instead of water. The selectively permeable membrane will allow small sugar molecules to move across the membrane, but large proteins would not be able to move. Okay, so here's an example um, over time from this beaker to this beaker to this beaker showing the movement of the molecules. The sugar molecules are here in the rectangles and the water molecules are here in the circles. Facilitated diffusion is passive transport. No energy is required for facilitated diffusion to occur. Facilitated diffusion is different than regular diffusion. It involves proteins. Those proteins that are embedded on the membrane are involved with facilitated diffusion. Transport proteins will move the materials through the membrane. There are three kinds of transport proteins. One is uniport. Uniport will carry a single molecule, meaning uni, across the membrane. Symport will move two different molecules at the same time in the same direction simultaneously. And three is antiport, exchanging two molecules in opposite directions. So here's a picture of this um, transport. Here is the transporter molecule going through the membrane in one direction, one molecule, that is uniport. If there are two different molecules going through the membrane, here's a lipid bilayer, um, at the same time, at the same direction, that is called symport. If they are going in opposite directions, then that is antiport. And that finishes podcast chapter 5, part 1.